I'm Martin Sims, and I'm uh, the Managing Director of Policy Tracker, which, as some of you may know, is a uh, newsletter and research company that covers spectrum policy in general. And uh, we're also very pleased to do some work for the Law Alliance, collecting regulatory policies for different countries around the world. And uh, so we've got to about 60 countries so far. And uh, this is used by members of the Alliance to work out whether they can, what, in what uh, technical capacity and what frequency bands they can deploy devices around the world. And uh, the in the course of studying this, we have learned more about uh, um, the regulation of LoRa uh, devices, but we have learned how complicated it is. And uh, it had that familiar feeling of, of thinking that you the more you know about something, the, the less you feel you know. So uh, I'm very pleased to have on the panel some people who are genuine experts in this field. And um, we've got some chairs from uh, SEPT. Uh, we've got uh, Andy Gowans from Ofcom in the UK, who's also the chair of the SRD maintenance group in SEPT. Uh, from the Frequency Management Working Group, we have uh, Daniel Bielfeld from Binetza and Vincent Dupere from ANFR. And, um, Online, we also have Alice Brabinek from the European Commission. So um, I'm very pleased to hand over to those. And I think we're having Alice first, aren't we? It's, yeah. So let me sit down and uh, we'll I'll move over to hearing from to Alice from the European Commission. Uh, yes. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Alice Brabinek speaking. I'm apologizing for the fact that I could not uh, join the conference on the spot. I'm joining remotely from the from Brussels, and I hope everything will go smoothly with my presentation and uh, Q A session. Um, I would like uh, just to say about my current work with the Commission. I'm working for DG Connect for Radio Spectrum Unit uh, since 15 years already. And currently, I am dealing with uh, spectrum requirements for uses such as short range devices and uh, bus airlines, among other things. So I can say, I could say it's all about uh, my work is all about license exempt uh, spectrum. And I am very delighted to be uh, invited to LoRa One World Expo taking place today. Um, ladies and uh, gentlemen, uh, my presentation is a bit uh, a general one because uh, as someone coming uh, from the world of spectrum regulation at EU level, uh, I should start from the be beginning, perhaps uh, uh, bringing up uh, a definition we are using, uh, what is uh, Internet of Things, IoT. and. Uh, 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 a definition we are currently uses uh, tells us that uh, IoT represents uh, the next step towards the digitization of our society and economy, where objects but also people are interconnected through communication networks and report about their status and uh, or also about their sur surrounding environment. So, uh, in this sense, uh, uh, IoT merges physical and virtual worlds and creates smart environments. And terrestrial and satellite connections are uh, possible. And uh, with regard to satellite possibilities for connecting IoT, I would like to refer to an excellent white paper uh, drafted or prepared by the company Ecostar Mobile and entitled Satellite-Based LoRa Unlocks Europe-Wide IoT. Uh, I would like also to bring another definition which appeared in the RSPG opinion on IoT and which says that IoT refers to the interconnection via the internet of computing devices which are embedded in everyday objects and uh, which enable them to send and 
receive data. This definition is a bit uh, simpler than the first one, but, uh, but uh, I think both definitions are valid. Uh, from both definitions, it is obvious that IoT is a heterogeneous world of applications and um, applications and operational requirements are multiple. So as regards wireless IOTs, there is no single solution for accessing spectrum that would fit all possible usage cases because there are different technical requirements. There are different uh, requirements as regards the data rate, the reliability of uh, connections, range, short range versus wide range, or also output power. Uh, my next slide uh, tells us about uh, RSPG roadmap for IoT spectrum access, because uh, our uh, advisory body, Radio Spectrum Policy Group, prepared in 2017 its first uh, opinion on spectrum access for Internet of Things devices. And uh, there is a very, very nice um, illustration of this roadmap. So I replicated this in this slide. And this basically tells that IOTs can use dedicated spectrum um, using spectrum uh, for mobile networks, but also there are dedicated wide, wide area technologies and I would I would name Sigfox, Flora and Paytless. So uh, this first possibility for spectrum access for IAT ensures wide area coverage and it is also good in terms of the possibility to manage the expectations uh, regarding quality and, uh, and uh, of service. And um, just a few examples of the bands. These are the bands harmonized for public mobile networks like 700, 800, 900, uh, 1,800 megahertz. And um, another possibility for uh, IoT to get spectrum access is to use shared spectrum. Uh, we know there are dedicated local area technologies like Zigbee or Erlans, but also more general local area technologies like Bluetooth or Erlans. And uh, these are basically short range communications, uh, rather clustered connectivity, for instance, inside buildings. But uh, of course, if you use shared spectrum, uh, the quality of service uh, can sometimes be not satisfactory, so it's we should rather speak for 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 best efforts in ensuring quality of service. And uh, now, ladies and gentlemen, let me go back um, to a general regulatory matter. I would like to say a few words about EU legislative framework for radio spectrum. Uh, it was a radio spectrum decision adopted in 2002, which laid down basis for a genuine uh, spectrum policy at European level. And the basic feature of this decision it's, was the creation of radio spectrum committee and uh, that this decision enabled uh, the development of various harmonization measures, commission decisions, on various spectrum topics. Just I would like to remind that we have also European Electronic Communications Code. The last uh, amendment uh, dates back to 2018. And uh, on the roadmap for, for spectrum policy, we still have radio spectrum policy program. And as I already mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, the commission has a radio spectrum policy group, RSPG, which is uh, its expert group um, consisting of high level representatives of uh, ministries, but also from uh, regulatory authorities from member states uh, who deal with uh, uh, radio spectrum topics. So it's high, high level advisory body, which issues 
opinions and reports on various uh, aspects on spectrum policy. And um, as I already mentioned, we have a radio spectrum committee, uh, which, uh, which uh, is chaired by the commission and uh, its members are representatives of spectrum management authorities from all 27 member states. Plus we have also observers like Norway and Liechtenstein and um, uh, this committee develops, discusses and develops technical harmonization measures, which are then adopted as implementing decisions by the radio spectrum committee. And uh, just to complete the picture, I would say also it's, uh, it doesn't concern so much the area of license exam spectrum that, that the commission is also uh, following international negotiations on uh, radio spectrum topic. It's uh, worldwide uh, radio communications. The next one will take place uh, next year, 2023. Also, the Commission, uh, neither the European Union are negotiating parties. These are only our member states. The Commission uh, takes up uh, some of the coordinating role that it prepares the Council decision for the position that uh, member states should take take and follow during uh, uh, WRC negotiations. And uh, in my next slide, I would like to highlight our cooperation with uh, CPT. I think uh, most of you are aware about uh, what we, this stands for. It's European Conference of uh, Postal and Telecoms Administrations, which consists of representatives of uh, Spectrum regulators from Europe. So it's EU 27 plus uh, other European countries which are not members of the European Union. And uh, I would like to highlight uh, uh, a huge added value of CPT for the Commission. CPT has a technical expertise. So uh, it helps the Commission to prepare uh, harmonization measures, Commission decisions, and um, uh, Commission gives mandates to CPT to study certain uh, spectrum topics. For instance, we have since 2006 a permanent mandate on short range devices. Uh, uh, this is uh, category of, of uh, uh, radio equipment that uses license exam spectrum and that could be suitable, that can be suitable also for diverse IoT devices and uh, applications. And uh, CPT in response to mandates uh, uh, gives reports to the commission and these reports are technical basis for implementing decisions that are developed by a radio spectrum committee and adopted by the commission. And uh, I would like also to mention, also I know that uh, uh, the next speaker, uh, Andy Govens will speak more about this, that CPT develops its own uh, uh, regulatory instruments on various spectrum topics. For instance, ERC recommendation 7003 on short range devices, also, these regulatory instruments are legally non-binding in contrast to, to commission implementing decisions which are binding and, it's, and their implementation is closely monitored by commission services. But uh, these uh, CPT regulatory instruments are a very useful indicator on where the market with uh, radio equipment is going and what technical conditions are possible for certain category short range uh, of sh short range devices. So uh, there is also a tremendous added value in CPT when developing these regulatory uh, instruments. Uh, one moment, please. Yeah, in my next next slide, I would like uh, to speak about uh, 
harmonized spectrum for uh, for Internet of Things, uh, harmonized at, uh, at the level European Union. But first, I would like to mention that uh, European Electronic Communications Code contains provisions to promote the development of IoT, but uh, the code uh, has a more general uh, impact because it's focusing on the regulation of electronic communications network and services. So when we are coming to EU spectrum regulatory framework, I noted on this slide uh, the web link to the list on the Commission website of all harmonization decisions, uh, which were adopted since 2004, I think. So you can re really, really um, assess how much work has been done in the field of harmonization of spectrum in Europe. And uh, as regards harmonized licensed exempt uh, spectrum, uh, as regards short range devices, we have uh, two decisions. The first one is a generic uh, short range devices decision, which was uh, adopted in 2006. And uh, we have a permanent mandate to CPT uh, to update this decision. So this decision was has last been uh, amended uh, this year. So it was already the, the eighth update and nine, now CPT is working on the ninth update. And um, the advantage of having short range devices decision at European level is that you don't need any individual license. You only have a general authorization in national law and then you can start using these short range devices across all the borders of all the member states in the Union. So there is a, a huge market potential for, for radio equipment using a spectrum according to short range devices decision. And uh, here I listed a few bands that could be suitable for Internet of Things applications like 169, 133, 162 to 868 or, or 2.4 GHz or 5.8 GHz. And uh, uh, when we, when we uh, go further in our view, review of harmonized license exam spectrum. I would like to mention also decisions on VAS Erlan, on VAS Erlans at 5 gigahertz and uh, 6 gigahertz band. That could be also, uh, we know that the Wi-Fi technology could also be suitable for, uh, for instance, IoT sensors uh, in buildings. So there are two decisions. Uh, 2022-169 for the 5 gigahertz band and 2021-1067 uh, for the lower 6 gigahertz band. And then still on short range devices, uh, uh, the things are never easy. So I should also uh, remind that there is a specific SRD decision 2018-1538, which was last amended this year. And this concerns the harmonization of uh, two bands, 874 to 876 and 915 to 921 megahertz for some SRD applications, including IoT based on networked short uh, range devices in data networks. And uh, why we put these uh, categories of short range devices into a separate specific decision, because here we must really sometimes in some member states divide from the re regime of general authorizations, because in some member states, national restrictions may apply due to the use of uh, these or also adjacent bands by government services, for instance, public order and defense and by the railway sector, for instance, uh, railway mobile radio or extended GSMR applications. But there is really the goal 
to make available at the European level the minimum core bands for uh, networked short range devices. And uh, I should also, ladies and gentlemen, mention harmonized license spectrum that could be also, also suitable for some kinds of uh, Internet of Things devices and uh, applications. This is, for instance, decision 2021-173, so decision, decision re very recent, adopted this year on the 900 megahertz band and 1800 megahertz bands, uh, which takes into account uh, use by IoT applications. And just to mention that other possibilities in harmonized bands for terrestrial mobile networks uh, can be found in 700 megahertz, 800 megahertz, 2.1 gigahertz, 2.6 gigahertz, and 3.4 to 3.6 uh, gigahertz. With that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I reached uh, the uh, end of my presentation. I thank you very much for your attention. And I would like to give the floor to the next speaker by stopping sharing my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank, thank you very much. Um, we'll just go through the speakers and have some questions at, at the end. Um, please, we're very keen to get your questions, so please write them down as everyone goes through. Uh, if I could hand over to Andrew Gowans, who's from Ofcom, and also the uh, chairman of uh, the SEPT group on uh, short-range devices. Thank you. Thanks. Um, yeah, okay. So I work for Ofcom, an international spectrum management team. Um, I also, um, recently, well, say recently, a couple of years ago, took over the SRDMG chairmanship. I've got a lot of experience in a lot of other different aspects of spectrum management, the mobile, the Wi-Fi community, and also satellite, et cetera, et cetera. So my main role in the SRD maintenance group is really to try and evolve, let's say, the the regulator instruments that we have under our control. And that's what it is in Europe in this kind of SRD maintenance group. It's very different from elsewhere, I'd say, in, uh, in other aspects of uh, the spectrum regulatory world in set because it's actually a maintenance group which means you've got a dedicated group for just short range devices and it covers a multitude of different types of radio systems. So LoRa One fits in to maybe another, even in the bands that they're going into, there's probably about another five or six mainstream radio type of technologies that you're competing against for using the spectrum. So it's important to highlight that. It's quite a complicated area when you get into license attempt because it's the regulations are written in a kind of technology neutral way to allow some innovation, let's say, which Laura wants taking the opportunity. So we sit under the banner of CPT, which uh, Alès has uh, given you some background in, but there's basically 46 European countries, member countries at the moment. The CPT uh, ranges from the 27 member states, who are all members of CPT, to people like Turkey, Azerbaijan, and places like that, further out, you know, from uh, what you'd say is mainstream EU, if you like, or Western European countries. So it covers quite a diverse kind of range of views, let's say, and uh, topologies. So under there, you have the kind of electronic communications committee, and then under that, you have kind of three sub working groups, if you like. You've got the Conference for Party Group, which prepares for WRCs every four or five years. Uh, you have the Frequency Management Group, which we fall under, which uh, Vincent is the chair of. And then you have another group called Spectrum Engineering, which basically does the nuts and bolts of Spectrum Engineering to see how different types of services can share in the bands that we, we look at. So the deliverables that, that mainly people are interested in outside are the actual spectrum deliverables, if you like, 
the harmonisation of the lower rows and how the spectrum is used. Uh, as I say, they kind of cover the 46 member countries, but in CBT they're signed up to on a voluntary basis. Whereas in the European Commission, as LS is alluded to, they're, they're signed up on a mandatory basis, more or less, unless you do a derivation which could only last for so many years. So when we look at short range devices, I think you've got to look at the, the main short range device instrument, which is 703. Uh, that actually contains a large number of frequency ranges and bands. And it's quite a complicated uh, piece of legislation, let's say, in terms of if you sign up to it. Because there's there's actually a number of annexes in that. So you, you've really got to look at in very close, if you like. It's almost, you can do a, probably do a, a, whole, a whole course in the university on these kind of regulations that are that, that complex, to be honest. Which keeps people like Martin in the job doing a lot of stuff to find out, to give people directions on how their, their equipment will fit in there. So, you know, there's, as I said, there's over 13 separate annexes. Each annex may have sub-bands. Some of them maybe have 10, 12 sub-bands in there. And some of them may actually be duplicated even within the same annex, but have different, different power levels and different kind of duty cycles that they have to meet in order to meet those power, power levels. So it's pretty complex. Uh, piece of legislation, let's say, because it's evolved over time. It's not been a revolutionary thing happened in these, these annexes. It's been an evolutionary thing. It's probably the best way to describe it is, I think, is a less is shown in the EU, kind of way they do legislation is top down. So it comes from the directives and maybe the, the communication codes and things like that. Whereas the CPT, a lot of it comes from the bottom up. So kind of Etsy might come to the CBT and say we want to we've got this technology that we want to introduce and they produce a thing called a systems reference document for that type of technology then we discuss whether we can put it in some of the bands and, and where they're targeting and then we do the studies the technical analysis to see if they fit in there so it's a kind of bottom-up approach more than a top-down I would say although you may have some uh, political issues in there that might might dictate some of the top-down stuff but mainly, I'd say it's it's a bottom-up approach unless we get a mandate from from EU, which which has been stated, I think, from LS as well. And then on top of that, you've got the kind of national implementations in the CPT, well, especially in 703. There's actually an appendix which shows you which bands are being and which which regulations are have been adopted in all the countries. And hopefully, that's up to date, but sometimes it takes time for the administrations to filter that information through to the appendix. But that's probably the best source: appendix one and appendix three, which kind of shows you where administrations are not adopting some of the things and some of these regulations. So it's quite complicated. And then you've got the relevant ETSI standards, which are mentioned in the, the document, but. Uh, they're actually under a different part of legislation, meaning under the Radio Equipment Directive, but they are directed how they meet that in some of our spectrum regulations. Uh, so, <clears throat> as I said, they're applied on a, EC decisions are applied on a mandatory basis, although you can adopt less stringent technical conditions than the EC technical conditions. And that's quite specific to SRDs, it's not the same for all. EC spectrum decisions and a lot of them are based on the work undertaken by mandate by CPT. So basically the EC decisions are normally a subset of what we do in SEPT. So SEPT might have a, a wider range of possibilities let's say in their regulations but the EC normally kind of produces a subset of that. So for you guys in Laura One, when we had this this uh, regulatory uh, panel, we were kind of told to concentrate on some of the bands here. So really 433, 800 and 915 bands are really where you, you'd expect a lot of one technologies to be in. So the three annexes that really covers these things that you may go into and the legislation, if you like, the technical 
conditions that apply to these plants are Annex 1, Annex 2 and Annex 3 and, that, and they cover different things. Annex 1 is kind of catch-all for non-specific short-range devices. Annex 2 is kind of tracking and tracing and data acquisition which a lot of your sensor stuff fits under. And then you've got wideband data transmissions which would normally be higher higher bitrate systems really maybe than what Laura One's looking at. But you could there's no reason why you couldn't fit under that. And then you've got the appendices one and three, as I said, they cover national implementation sets. There's also I would say a caveat to that. There's a lot of other annexes, as I said, there's thirteen annexes. Uh, and Laura One technologies may fit under some of these specific applications. So you may have a different dispensation for that type of use, if you like, under that application. So you really want to check them. I will say these slide sets are all going to be available, so we don't really have to take pictures if you want. And there's links in there to, to all of these uh, to like bigger documentations. Uh, it doesn't seem to want to move on. But. to move the slides on manually. Oh, it seems to have worked now. Oh, here we go. Yeah, so, so Annex 1's kind of, I've tried to give you a flavour of what the annexes look like, but I don't want to go into too much detail on these, because as I said, the slide sets are there. And it gives you an idea of kind of, this is Annex 1, and this is just the three bands or subset, sub bands that cover the, the 433 to 434. As you can see, there's, there's kind of different columns that give you what the power level you've got to meet, the duty cycle, and any other kind of modulation or a bandwidth kind of restrictions there, then anything, then the notes might give you some mitigation techniques, etc., etc., that you might have to meet. And then you've got notes that are applied to there, and that gives you kind of some other information on some of the technical restrictions that you need to meet. So th this is actually the the real original 800 band, let's say the the 862 to 870 and that has evolved over time and that's really shared by a lot of other types of application specific stuff too <clears throat> so you can see how complicated it gets this is just two frequency ranges and look at all the sub bands within that and look at all the different kind of regulations and some of these bands are actually sub bands may even be duplicated or sit over each other uh, and you can see the different power levels range from 25 milliwatts, 5 watts, milliwatts sorry, up to 500 milliwatts. So it's quite a big range of different uses that you might have there and different type of duty cycles that you need to meet and different mitigation techniques like listen before talk and agile frequency uh, use and stuff like that. And this is the kind of newer bands, I would say. Uh, and that's the above 870, which were the old core bands, if you like, that were evolved. These ones have only been available maybe about five years, something like that. Is even that. Um, and even now we're trying to evolve these ones. So it's an ongoing process. So this is for the non-specific short range device use, and then we get into the specific. As you can see, there's even here, there's two sub bands, uh, the 870 to 874, and then the 915 to 9 or 9 megahertz, which these these kind of came about because there was demand to try and have some harmonization across the world, really. And these are probably more similar to what the bands that you see in the US and Asia around about the same areas. But it became more complicated because of some of the GSM bands in Europe. Uh, but in the same, or, or in different areas from what the US and Asia had, let's say. So Annex 2, again, the main bands here are again these new bands, and part of the old one, where you'll see again there's different types of requirements. But I think the interesting thing here is the power level is quite high on these ones, so you can go up to 500 milliwatts, whereas if you look at the previous one, you only 25 milliwatts in the generic one. So if you go application specific, you may actually get a bit more power, but then you might have more mitigation techniques and duty cycles may be reduced, such like. 
So it's, and all these have came about of looking at sharing between services that may be non-SRD and services that are SRD, if you like. So intra-sharing and inter-sharing, uh, two different aspects of that. Again, you've got the 900 band, which is available, but also split into two different power levels in these bands. And then you've got the wideband transmission systems in Annex 3, which again have different rules and regulations to meet. So really, when you're, when you're producing equipment, you're better to look and see where you fit and what your market is and what you're trying to achieve. And then try and look at these annexes and see if you could fit under those annexes. <clears throat> so things to note, I would say, is there's quite a big variance between what's in the EC ERC recommendation, what's in the EC decision. I would say 703 covers a wider range than uh, what you're going to see in the EC decision. And a lot of these restrictions are due to, as been mentioned previously, military use and uh, GSMR use in some of the EU member states. And the next presentation is actually going to go in a bit more detail on that, so that's why I didn't cover that in any detail. Uh, again, really to find out where all these restrictions are and what companies allow the use of the, if you like, the expanded range, you really need to look at uh, appendices one and three. Now, both in this particular area of the 800, 900 bands, the newer ones, and in some of the older ones with the higher powers, there's a requirement to have a master network access point, which a lot of people ask a lot of questions about. Basically, it's an access point that has to be like a master access point. So any device that really can't geolocate and doesn't know where it is, has to be able to geolocate through its, through its master device, more or less. Uh, so that's that's that requirement there, and it's really mobile nomadic devices, and a lot of that is to protect some of these systems in countries where you don't want devices to, that are nomadic, mobile, to move around basically between different countries without having some control over the frequencies that you use. Uh, a lot of what's going on in the Etsy standards on that and how you implement it. So really, if you want to see the implementation of these these requirements in the equipment and how you place equipment on the market to meet them. Uh, the Etsy standards are really what you want and these are the two Etsy standards that you really need to have a look at. And some of them, I think one of them is actually complete and I think one's in kind of final draft. Uh, looking at future stuff, well, I think also the next presentations are gonna go into. Uh, we are looking at evolving these bands a bit more, particularly the 915 one. Uh, to try and allow some more higher powers in there and maybe provide a bit more spectrum in some of these bands for uh, SRDs. <clears throat> so uh, that will be covered again, I think, uh, what's happening in there and what the thinking is of. I think mainly for some of the countries who have got the problems with the military and the GSMR, what they think they may be able to provide solutions for. So it will be more harmonised, let's say, across uh, CPT and across EU, possibly. There's also a consultation from my UK hat, Zofcom, that we've we've got out, which just completed on the 4th of July. Uh, and that's basically looking at how we implement some of the recent changes in these bands, including the requirement for the control by master map. Uh, so if you want to look at the UK regulations and the latest likely latest iteration of it, you probably uh, need to have a look at that consultation. Again, there's links in the slides, so people could go and read them all yourself. Okay, try to be as quickly as possible so I can give some time to others. And hopefully, if you really need the, the main information, it's in the slides. Okay. Uh, we can now move on to da Daniel Bielfeld from uh, Binetza in uh, Germany, who's also involved in the SET Frequency Management Working Group. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. And, uh, welcome everybody to come up 
presentation here. Um, I'm uh, working in VNets A in the uh, international uh, section for international frequency matters. My focus is uh, on the European sector, so I'm participating in the ECC plenary and uh, in the RSCOM meetings to represent Germany. And as mentioned here, I'm also the vice chairman of the working group for frequency management of the ECC. So um, today I will um, start with some general remarks as to how we manage uh, generally spectrum demands in Germany, but probably very similar in other European countries. And then in the second part, I will uh, go to some more specific issues related to the spectrum management of SRD data networks in Germany. But to start with um, the, the more general part with the observation that spectrum demand um, is usually very application specific. So some applications require high data rates, others have rather high um, requirements with respect to reliability and deployment scenarios vary a lot between applications and so on. And therefore, uh, it can be concluded from this observation that there is not a one-size-fits-all uh, solution uh, to respond to spectrum demands. Um, however, there may be some commonalities um, that, that allow to process these spectrum demands at least under, though treated individually, though under uh, certain common processes. And <clears throat> usually demand is addressed in the following order here. First, it is checked whether uh, the use can be um, accommodated under existing regulations. And um, this is a very important step because users and also the market is not always aware of all the options that are available to accommodate um, their new ideas. And if it turns out that this is not possible, then the second step would be to review um, the existing regulation with the intention to adapt them to the new requirements, if that is possible. And if also this is not possible, then um, the last option may would be to see if there could be a new uh, spectrum solutions for this application identified. And um, so how how are we guided by this for all these three uh, steps here? Usually um, the objective of spectrum management is to enable spectrum options for these for, for the market, for the users. And um, in order to do that, we are guided by a number of uh, general spectrum management principles like interference-free and uh, efficient use of spectrum, technology neutrality, the um, uh, priority of general licenses over individual licenses and so on. And th these objectives are more or less given by uh, the German Telecommunications Act and probably very similar in, in other European countries due to the European regulatory uh, framework that was mentioned by Alice in the first uh, presentation. So spectrum managers try to enable spectrum options. However, the, the, the choice of the option for a specific application is something that is up to the user, up to the market. That is something that the regulator should not decide, but the market should decide which option fits best to their needs. <clears throat> so um, how, how do we do that? How do we process uh, such a demand? Um, so Germany is in the center of, of Europe, and uh, we have a number of uh, neighboring countries, and we are also uh, a member of the state of the European Union and therefore a part of the European single market and therefore we target harmonized solutions wherever it is feasible. And um, we believe that um, to, to, to process um, the, these demands and to, to target those harmonized solutions, the best way is to use the existing European spectrum regulatory framework as presented here in the picture with the three major players, that is the CPT, you know, rather central part of it, as we had already in previous presentations. And we had the European Commission to uh, enable binding harmonization. And we have uh, standardization body Etsy uh, to uh, produce harmonized standards and to, to bundle industry requests. So work in CPT uh, can, can be initiated on, on a number of different ways. Uh, usually, if especially if there's a demand from the industry side. It is uh, initiated by so-called Etsy system reference documents, SR docs, and which then uh, are 
desirable start of a work item because it represents a consolidated industry view and uh, normally uh, those system reference documents describe the new demand and the new technical characteristics of the new applications and uh, should also provide uh, proper deployment characteristics and so on so as many as much possible as many information as possible uh, should, should be provided so that uh, CPT can use them in order to conduct the uh, relevant um, compatibility studies in the working group of both spectrum engineering and apart from this uh, process to identify new spectrum options um, this existing regulatory framework also provides a good platform to exchange best practices and uh, also to review existing regulations so it, that means in, in total these uh, framework can be used for all the three steps I presented in the previous uh, slide. So after these more general notes, I will now come to um, spectrum ma management issues related to SRD data networks. So SRD data networks is a, a terminology used in CPT uh, to uh, refer in a technology neutral way to uh, low power wide area networks like and technologies like uh, LoRaWAN. And um, first, I would like to come to the bands 870 to, to the situation of the bands 870, 876, and 915 to 921 megahertz uh, in Germany. Um, as we heard, um, the, the regulation on the European level of these bands is a very specific one. You know, I think in the first presentation from Alice in the, from the European Commission it was made clear that there, this is a very spe specific regulatory uh, regulation. Uh, due to the existence of uh, sensitive um, incumbent systems and services in these bands in a number of European countries. So and here you see uh, this uh, displayed uh, the situation in Germany. Uh, so the figure shows how, how these subbands are used. Um, we have the, the bands 870 to 876 and 915 to 921. They are designated and used uh, for various military applications. And um, the upper half of these uh, military bands are uh, shared by the military, by military applications and um, by uh, railway applications um, and only by railway applications. So the military only agreed to share these bands by the railway applications because these applications uh, are uh, locally uh, clearly uh, coordinate because they only appear around railway tracks and they are also managed by a single license holder which in Germany is Deutsche Bahn. Um, so in, in, and, um, in, in the upper part around above 874.4 and 919.4 megahertz respectively um, there's uh, implementing decision from the European Commission to harmonize uh, this spectrum for railway mobile radio so this uh, is an umbrella term for GSMR and uh, the new railway system FRMCS. So this is harmonized in the European Union and also uh, there's a, a ECC decision on the CPT level. And as I mentioned, uh, Germany is in the center of Europe. So that also means uh, that we have a lot of uh, neighboring countries and but that also means that there are no number of European uh, railway corridors crossing through Germany. and. Um, Similar in other countries in Europe, that means that there's an increased demand for communication for railway purposes. And therefore, in Germany, we also implement the extended GSMR band going, uh, using, going from 873 to 876 and 980 to 921 megahertz. So in total, that means because of this situation and taking also into account that ECC report 200 shows that SRDs cannot share the same band uh, with military applications that there are currently no possibilities to introduce any SRD or FID applications uh, in those bands in Germany. And that also means that um, what was presented by Andy in this previous presentation, that this concept or the requirement of mobile and um, nomadic nodes to be controlled by master network access points um, Quite important also for, for Germany because um, this requirement uh, ensures that uh, the military and the, the railway applications are protected uh, from 
interference from SID. So um, after telling you what is not possible, maybe I can go to the a bit more positive note uh, and say what is possible. And uh, here we see, uh, especially as very important, the band 862 to 870 megahertz, which is kind of the harmonized uh, core bands for SRD uh, in Europe below one gigahertz. And if you look into the implementation table and you mentioned in um, ERC recommendation 703, it is much more widely uh, implemented uh, than the bands uh, on the previous slides. And um, this band 862 to 870 megahertz, uh, in addition to um, these uh, entries for non-specific SRDs, which may be of interest for uh, for uh, data networks and can be used, as Andy has explained, there are also some specific uh, parts uh, specifically designated for SRD data networks. And uh, in particular, these are these uh, four channels um, that are also used for FID. With, with the green ones here. Um, so SRD are operating on a general license basis, so that means that administrations normally do not have too much detailed information with respect to the usage of those bands. But uh, as far as we know, um, most of the um, SRD data networks in Germany are currently operated in the 868 megahertz range. So partly using this 500 megahertz channel there available, but also the 25 uh, milliwatt uh, range uh, around it. And um, if in future there's additional demand, especially for higher power uh, SRDs, we believe that uh, an intensified use of the other four channels that have been identified a couple of years ago, uh, with, which can also be used with 500 milliwatts, um, could, could be an interesting option for SRD data networks in the future. So other options below one gigahertz for SRDs and SRD data networks um, are, as already mentioned also before, the 169 megahertz band, which is harmonized, and also specifically the 433 megahertz band, which is uh, harmonized in Europe and also widely available on a global scale. And um, in, in the CPT report 77, um, which was a response of CPT the so-called AIDS update of the Euro decision of the European Commission. It was proposed to study in the ninth update, which is currently uh, being uh, handled in SRDMG, that there's a possibility to review the regulations for the 433 megahertz band and uh, with the intention to, to liberalize the regulation there. So in Germany, this band is already available on a more liberal basis than compared to um, the European regulations. So that means, of course, we would be open to any discussion that would uh, enable uh, more usage options uh, and, and uh, increased use by SAD data networks and other SAD applications, uh, also on a European basis. So with that, uh, we believe that there's uh, room for, um, for, the, the, for the development and the evolution of the um, SAD data network ecosystems uh, uh, in ecosystem in, in the coming future. Um, however, if there are any new ideas or new initiatives, new requirements coming from the industry, Germany is generally always open for any discussion uh, on these matters. And uh, but we would prefer if, if the existing processes I introduced in the beginning would be used for this purpose. Um, then in these process also uh, any um, country-specific uh, issues and um, problems could be addressed and potentially solved in really good European solutions. So that concludes my presentation and thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Da Daniel. Um, you mentioned some possible um, new bands that could be used for um, LoRa devices. Um, this is something Vincent is also going to talk about. So we'll hand over to Vincent uh, Dupair uh, from ANFR in France and also the chairman of the uh, working group on frequency management for SEMT. Thank you. So, hello. Yes. So, bonjour à tous. Uh, bienvenue à Paris. Welcome to Paris. 
so Vincent Durper, I am uh, the, the head of the European Affairs within uh, the French National Spectrum Agency and also the chairman of WGFM, which is the responsible group for the European regulation in, in CPT. So not just the EU as in Spain uh, by and by, but uh, really uh, many other countries uh, outside the EU uh, world. So here I will try to present you uh, the view from NFR related to future evolutions of uh, the regulatory framework for SRD and in particular uh, in the light of LoRa. So I hope this uh, you will find some useful uh, uh, information here. This slide is uh, rather usual. Uh, you have uh, the EU level, you have the CPT level, so it depends whether you are an EU member state or not. So obviously as France we are on the right side of this slide, so we need to be, uh, the, the decisions from the European Commission are binding, and so we need to implement that. In the recommendation 703, which uh, may be the most uh, famous uh, deliverable from the ECC, uh, you have more opportunities potentially compared to the EU regulatory framework. Uh, even in France, uh, there are a few uh, entries from 703 that are not part of the EU regulatory framework that are implemented in our national regulation. It does happen, not very often, but sometimes. And uh, for your information, on the left side, so everything which is in the EU regulation is also within 70 years. And so since you are uh, working on LoRa, uh, the two main analyses uh, that may be of interest for you are analyses one and two. It's true that analyses three may be also of interest, may, but maybe to a lesser extent because in added three it is for wideband data transmission so meaning above 600 kilohertz. Uh, something that uh, Daniel already mentioned so this is really specific to France but it may happen in other countries the SRD bands are military bands so this needs to be pretty uh, really clear and you need to keep it in mind because it means that as an SRD user, you may face interference from the militaries uh, if there is a need. So it do, usually it doesn't happen, but at least from a legal point of view, it's clear if uh, the military guys need to use the spectrum, they are free to do so, whatever happens. And so you have here the three uh, military bands that you can find in France uh, within the UHF uh, band. And you can see that even the, as in uh, Germany, the GSMR band, so the railway band, is also a military band. Okay, so the, the idea in this presentation is to show you what could be uh, the future evolution of uh, the regulation uh, as seen by France. And the first topic I would like to discuss with you is uh, the future of the non-specific SRD. And uh, as you may be aware in 703, but it is also the case in the EU uh, regulation, you have some bands which are listed here on this slide, uh, which are dedicated to alarms. And the thing is that in the past, so you see back in 2013 and in 2016, it has been envisaged by CPT that maybe there is no need to dedicate some spectrum to alarms because uh, you have more and more alarms using, for instance, the 2.4 GHz band. And we are also aware in these reports that some uh, CPT countries already open these bands on a, for, for any application and not specifically to alarms. And so here, what we would like to propose to CPT administrations is to uh, move all these alarms, except one, the social alarms, uh, to the non-specific SRD regulation, meaning that any SRD application, such as LoRa, could use from now on this spectrum. Uh, you have a strange uh, thing in the first entry of an H7 of 73, so this is, as you have understood, uh, picture of an H7 of 73. Uh, you have a strange uh, thing uh, in the first entry, so maybe even some simplification is also foreseen. Uh, we, we believe there is no need to, to define anymore uh, a maximum uh, bandwidth in the first entry, but that's a detail. When it comes to the social alarms, uh, 
the thing is that when you look back in history, and in particular in the two reports that are mentioned here, you don't have enough information to be confident in uh, being more liberal in this band. The social alarms are uh, those which are uh, used by uh, your grandmother or your grandfather. You know this uh, strange necklace and you press the button to call the emergency services. So this is very specific. And so because of, this, uh, because of that, we are of the view that social alarms should be kept apart, not being touched. And as part simply of the uh, simplification of 703, we would delete completely on its seven and the social alarms would be moved to an its two. Uh, maybe I shouldn't say so, uh, in particular in front of MD, but an its two is more or less the annex where you put everything, you do not know where you, you can place it somewhere. <laughs> okay, so this would be uh, the first proposal for, uh, from France uh, for the ninth uh, update. Uh, then you have the 915 megahertz band. We are in the same situation as Germany and also the Netherlands, uh, Portugal, Greece, and, and some countries. We have some military, as it's plain, military applications there. And so we need to be really cautious. And also for us, uh, being under the control of a master nap is a key feature, and definitely we will be very strong in keeping it. Our situation is slightly different compared to Germany because we were able to find an agreement with the military uh, sector to open uh, the band as per the EU decision. So we, for, for the SRD community, we are more lucky in France than in Germany. But it's really a national matter and the situation is different from one country to another. And as you may be aware, there were a lot of works uh, going on in CPT to see uh, if we could enhance the situation for the 500 milliwatt SRD in data networks. Uh, the conclusions are not easy to read, but basically what we are ready to propose for the EU decision because we are aware that there is a, a request from the industry is to have one block of 1.2 megahertz for 500 milliwatt SRD. So the original idea was to have was to be completely uh, over the RFID interrogator channels, so those who are uh, the, the big blue uh, rectangles. Uh, but there is a request to have contiguous spectrum from the industry, and we have also the same request from the military. They prefer also to have some contiguous spectrum available. So it is better for everyone to have a one to two megahertz block uh, for all the 500 milliwatt SRD. Uh, so this means uh, some reorganization compared to the current EU decision, but we believe this is fine because as far as we know, there is no rollout yet in Europe. In practice. Together with that, uh, we believe that we need some safe spectrum for 25 milliwatt SRD. So I suspect that you are more interested in 25 milliwatt SRD. And so to ensure this safe spectrum, we are ready to extend the harmonization of the 25 milliwatt SRD. You have two kinds of uh, SRD of 25 milliwatt. You have the generic ones. And so these ones would be extended down to 916.1 megahertz. And you have uh, what I used to call the domotics Wi-Fi, so 802.11ah, which is under an S3 of 703. And this one would be extended uh, down to uh, so 1 megahertz further down, so 9, uh, I can't remember. Uh, 916.4 megahertz. Uh, why? Because they are using 1 megahertz channel. So it is just problematic. So this is for the EU level. And clearly, because of the military, we cannot go beyond. It would be a red line for us to have further opportunities for recent. But then, of course, France or Germany or the other countries, we are not the only countries uh, in CPT, and some countries do not have uh, this uh, problem of coexistence with military. And so in 703, it's another stuff. We, we can envisage further opportunities that obviously would not be open in France. So we do not dream of that. In France, it will never be open. But in some countries, maybe in the UK, we could imagine that uh, other spectrum uh, could be open to 500 milliwatt SRD, so these are the black uh, boxes. 
And I must say for the time being, from a uh, French point of view, we uh, do not know yet what would be the technical conditions for these additional opportunities. Uh, the, the conclusions from uh, uh, the technical group within WGSC uh, need some analysis, some discussion even between administrations to be sure that everything will be fine and in particular no interference to uh, the mobile networks operators below 9.15 and also to the other SR. Another change that uh, we may propose, but it's really a nice to have a feature, maybe in 73 the uh, domotics Wi-Fi starts at 9.15.8 MHz, but it is basically useless because they have this one MHz channel in practice, so maybe it would be better to align with uh, what the industry does and start at uh, 9.16.4. Uh, but, but this is really a secondary uh, topic. So this is for the 9.15, and clearly from uh, a French point of view, this is, uh, let's say, the final evolution of the band uh, from our point of view. So it doesn't mean forever, forever, let's say, but for the next five or ten years, definitely. Because again, it is a military band, so we need to preserve the military usage. Another point, we have heard that uh, some uh, companies were interested in having satellite operations at 9.15 megahertz. Uh, why not? Uh, but uh, the thing is that uh, to be again extremely careful because we have this thing related to, to the map, which is here to ensure that the mobile or nomadic devices will not come in a country and start transmitting uh, while uh, they should not do so. So this is why in the definition of the term, it is clearly mentioned that it is a fixed terrestrial device. And this is a part of the definition which is extremely important for us, and even for us uh, who opened uh, the 915 megahertz band, but even more for, for instance, Germany, who didn't open the band. So this needs to be kept. So how... Uh, so this means clearly that the Earth to space uh, communications are not open at this stage uh, for LoRa devices. So this is for Earth to space. Of course, you, you need the way back, uh, the space to Earth. And uh, when it comes to space to Earth, so this is not part of the SRD regulation. This goes under the uh, worldwide uh, domain, so the ITU domain with the radio regulations, and in particular, Article 4.4. And if you want to have this space-to-earth communications in, in whatever the band is, you need to prove to uh, the countries where you will transmit that uh, it will be free of interference, that you will not interfere the existing applications. And in our case, it is a military band. So this means that if you are a company interested in having, uh, let's call it, satellite SRD at 915, you need to come and see each administration within CPT having military applications in the band and uh, do some technical coexistence studies with our military applications. And if things are okay in France, Germany, Netherlands, and so on, then we can consider modifying uh, the regulatory framework uh, in uh, 70.03 in CPT. It means, be, let's be clear on that, we will not allow the earth to space communications which fall under the SRD communication as long as we are not confident in the way around so space to earth communications. I hope uh, well, not easy yeah, because one time it is earth to space and the other space to earth. But, okay. uh, I take also this opportunity to uh, give you uh, an alert. Uh, this is mainly a proposal from the USA. Uh, the, there is a proposal to uh, introduce beam WPT. The WPT means uh, wireless power transfer in the UHF bands. And uh, unfortunately for us, uh, these are the core SRD bands in Europe. So 863, 870, and 970, 920. You can even see that it goes beyond the SRD band. It goes over the railway band. Uh, and so definitely this is a threat 
to both SRD and railways. And so I encourage you to contact your national administrations and promote uh, a position, a national position against such uh, introduction. If you want to do some beam WPT, you have some lovely bands to do so, such as the 2.4 GHz and the 5.8 uh, GHz band. Oh, be careful with the 5.8 because you have also some radars. In, in the, anyway, it's, it's truly an ISM band. Okay, so this is uh, the overall uh, conclusion. So there is a question mark because uh, please remember this is only the view from France and we are not the only administration in CPT, so uh, we need to find an agreement with our uh, counterparts, UK, Germany, Netherlands, and so on, Sweden. Uh, but uh, you, so you have some good news from me, potentially new opportunities in the UHF band if we change the status of the alarm bands. And uh, also uh, at 9.15, because we are ready to extend the 25 milliwatt uh, generic uh, SRD down to 9.16.1. Uh, and then uh, the bad news, because uh, I needed the bad news, of course. No, just kidding. Uh, you, we need to be extremely careful with the 9.15 megahertz. So do not expect a quick opening of this band to satellite communications. We are not opposing it, that's clear, but uh, we really need to uh, carefully study this possibility to be sure that the military applications will not be interfered. And if I am correct, this is my last slide. So many thanks to all of you. And Martin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, that was a very interesting presentation. Um, we've run a bit over time. Um, I'd really like to have some questions from the audience because uh, we sort of all come from the world of regulation and you come from the world of making things and deploying them largely, I think. So it'd be very interesting to hear your, hear your views and any, any questions that you have. Particularly, thank you. Gentlemen in the front row. Anybody able to answer that? Well, well, I'm not a satellite expert, so I can uh, I, I can relay the, the question to, to to ours. But what I can say is that when it comes to the Earth to space, so if you are compliant with the current SRD regulation, everything is fine. And then my understanding, what uh, what I was explained by a colleague for the Article 4.4, is that you need to prove for the space to Earth that you will not interfere. Uh, the applications present in the country uh, that you will cover. So you, my understanding is that you should contact each country and demonstrate them that everything will be fine. But Well, I, as I said, I'm not an expert, but this is, for the time being, my level of understanding.
course I had to. Yeah, yeah maybe I'll add yeah. to that. I think the problem is with the, the earth to space is you're probably, you have to put a spot beam of some sort that just covers one country, which isn't any good to you, you know. It all depends on what kind of space system you're putting up. Is it a Pico satellite system with lots of satellites? Is it a geostationary that covers a big area? You know, some of these have global beams, some have hemispheric, which covers two regions like, you know, Middle East, Europe. And some will have spot beams, which could cover a country or, a, you know, and all that stuff really would normally be done at ITU level. So normally, you, you, I mean, above the European regulations, let's say there's this thing called radio regulations that I don't know if everybody's aware of, which is based on international treaties of between countries and regions that basically say, OK, we're going to allocate this spectrum to terrestrial or space systems or, or uh, Earth exploration satellites or radio astronomy. And that's all managed at ITU level a little bit. We can do subsets of that within Europe. So you may be able to get an agreement in set, maybe for a downlink in that band that covers maybe just CPT countries. But then you're looking at the edge of CPT where you may have to be careful that your beam doesn't go anywhere over there. And that's where 4.4 comes into, as Vincent says, that under 4.4, you can do anything in your own country as long as you don't cause interference. And, and kind of, if you like, as long as you don't breach the international regulations that you've signed up to under the radio regs. So that's that's kind of where the satellite's a bit more complicated. In some respect, you know, the ITU was set up to manage maritime, aeronautical and satellite. The terrestrial elements of it kind of came in a bit later. Uh, so there's a whole kind of layer of regulations for satellite. I think the problem is ISM bands probably aren't covered at the moment. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, so you're talking about Leo's or... Well, just to say that, you know, the World Radio Conference is where that, where they change the radio rigs. So basically just now in Europe and then all over the world, in different regions, there's discussions going on about what the future agenda items be for the next radio conference, which will be in 2027 probably. So they're, they're planning these things kind of seven, eight years ahead sometimes. So you have to get in quite early to say, okay, we want to change the radio rigs. And then you need to get some buy-in in the different regions. And that will be put forward to the, this radio conference, in, which is in 23. So next year, there'll be a radio conference. And what they're working on is one of the agenda items, is the future agenda items for the next conference. So basically, you've missed this agenda, this, this WRC. So really, you need to start lobbying now within Europe, within uh, the, there's there's six six different regional organisations. Uh, there's CTEL, which covers North and South America. There's APT, which covers Asian countries. There's ATU, which covers the African countries. And there's ASMG, which covers the Middle East. And then there's RRC, which covers the Russian kind of Commonwealth countries. So that's you really need to lobby either get one of them to put it on the agenda, or get as many as you can get. Then the more chance you've got of getting that on. Uh, but that's where they then, then they'll analyze to see if you could share. ISM, you've probably got an opportunity in ISM as long as there isn't any other kind of uh, satellite systems or aeronautical systems in the say. So that's really what, what you have to do as, a, as a, an industry, I would say. I think, like, I, I've been involved in this process for Wi-Fi Alliance and 802.11. They did not have a clue about spectrum regulation. They just, they were given spectrum and they used it and they developed products. 
and you guys are in that situation now. Now you're evolving and you need spectrum because if you don't have spectrum, you cannot operate. That's it. You just don't have a you don't have a market if you can't use spectrum. Uh, so you really need to evolve into your spectrum management, if you like, strategy. You need to lobby the regulators. You need to be. I mean, people spend fortunes on this. IMT community spend an absolute fortune on it. They have their own organisations that just constantly speak to spectrum management organisations. So you kind of once you start going into the satellite world, you're going into. You need to lobby. Thank you for the, the question. Um, I think we must be reaching the end of our time. Uh, do, do we have any more questions? Oh, we do. Okay. Well, I, I'm happy. To, I'm happy to continue. I, I don't know. I don't know what organisationally whether we can continue. Can we? Is that okay? Five ten minutes. Great. Okay. Um, please, uh, please ask your question. Uh, Alice from the European Commission was saying he can't hear the question, so I. Maybe repeat your question so that Alice can hear it as well. But please go ahead. That's a, that's a good question. Um, we we do try to do something similar to what you described for the um, uh, for the Law of Alliance, which is a, a, a membership thing. So that may or may not be uh, suitable. Well, uh, <laughs> that may you know that may be that may be suitable for you. Um, I I just just to repeat your question so that uh, Alice can hear it. You were asking how do product designers keep track of changing regulations to understand whether what they're doing is likely to meet the regulations in a, a range of countries. Um, that Alice may have something to say on that. I, I don't know whether any of the panellists have, have any thoughts on how you can do that or how easy or difficult it is. Uh, hello. Uh, Please go ahead. Hear it? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, so, a uh, gentleman is asking uh, which way would be perhaps the most appropriate to keep track of changing regulations. So, for I think he means uh, European countries. Uh, in, in, uh, in Europe, we have a very well functioning European Frequency Information System, EFIS. EFIS. Uh, which uh, keeps track of all spectrum uh, regulations for the whole spectrum range and is very useful in particular for short range devices. And uh, you can, you can uh, have an overview about the European Common Allocation Table, but also for uh, allocations at national level. But there are some restrictions. So, so I would recommend to manufacturers to consult a face database, uh, not only to you, European manufacturers, but also manufacturers from outside Europe when they are exporting to Europe. Um, I don't know whether someone from the panel, someone else would uh, like to complete me. <laughs> um, we have. Um... One more question. So, so uh, maybe, maybe I could just add that. Yes. The UK came out of Europe, and really the Harmonised Standard is where you you probably go first for for things that are there now. And Alice is right for things that are there now. Then that's fine. But things for the future, you really need to monitor what's going on and 
CPT or Etsy, really. That's in the, the appropriate group in Etsy, I think it's TG28, I think ERM TG28, which does most of the stuff that you're looking at. And then obviously SRDMG and the other one's SE24. Uh, basically, they're all publicly available, what work items that they're working on. So you can go to the website, the set.org, and you can look and look at the work items and see what they are. If you want to initiate something in some of these bands that's different, then you have to kind of pull your resources, I would say, either through an Etsy SR doc that they've said or approach maybe a number of administrations to set to try and initiate that work too. So there's there's kind of routes that you have to take. But unfortunately I understand as a, a small company trying to navigate this on your own, it's it's pretty difficult. That's probably why the Laurel and why the alliance that you've got here is really that's kind of what Wi-Fi Alliance ended up doing, they ended up bringing in a regulatory expert just to, to concentrate on what they want in the future. And that's where you guys are now, but it's kind of, you're kind of at that juncture of where you need to go. Wait, th thank you. Yeah, another question at, at the back now. Thanks. Sorry, so, so to be clear, you, you're, what you're trying to, what you're involved in developing it is a LoRa product, but it's aimed at the military or it's designed yeah. for military uses? Could it, could it be? Yeah. I, I, I think it would be in the EU decisions about which bands you could use for short range devices. But I think when you talk about military, there's different levels of military cooperation. So, you know, the military, as they said in most countries, are. Probably even in the UK, they've probably got some, I don't know, to be honest, I can't remember if it's, it's designated as a shared plan, because if you look at what we have in the UK is the national frequency planning uh, aspect, and it tells you in there that if it's a commercial band, the military band, or a joint shared commercial military band. And it depends then who, military kind of allow a lot of uses in their bands that are commercial, but they still have the kind of the control over the band. Uh, when it comes to military uses of LoRa technology, if it's in military bands, the military will manage that themselves. They have their own spectrum managers. So that that's where that kind of difference you'll see is there. And uh, even at the military level, you've got national military kind of use, then you've got NATO bands that sit on top of that. And if it's a NATO band, then it may be coordinated with the US, the UK, other bands. And that's, that's kind of where you sit. And there may be some European stuff that goes on. There's a European Defence Agency as well. But how much that's coordinated depends on the military people involved in that. But that would be outside the commercial side of things. I would say. Yeah. What I would like to add is that uh, it was mentioned by Yeres. Uh, you have the website efis.cpt.org. 
And uh, somewhere, I can't remember the link exactly, you have uh, the section related to 703, so the recommendation, and then for each annex, you will have the implementation status in each country. So uh, it's not a legally binding information because it is on a voluntary basis that the administrations provide that, so it may not be up to date, but normally they are supposed to update it uh, regularly. Uh, this is what we do in France. Uh, but then you will have already a very good view in which countries this specific country you want to use is allowed or not. From my point of view, this is for the CPT countries uh, the best uh, approach and straightforward thing to do to know whether you would be allowed or not to transmit. Outside CPT, the best is to uh, find uh, the national frequency allocation table, uh, which will give you some preliminary information whether the band is military or not. Yeah, just to add that for SRDs, you're actually lucky because there's Appendix 1 and 3 are, that's generated from FSO. So that should be up to date all the time. So as a, an appendix of that, then you can just look straight into it. So it's done for you. Well, th thank you very much. Uh, thank you for all your questions and thank you to our panel for their very interesting presentations and also for their advice and opinions and giving so generously of their time and thank you particularly to Alice who's been listening in from perhaps from Brussels or not I don't know exactly but from, from Brussels from yeah. Brussels okay yeah <laughs> well, if we could end by uh, giving uh, everyone a round of applause so thank you very much for that person.